Our brains are what make us us. Since the birth of early hominins, the size of the brain was what distinguished our species from others. Australopithecus afarensis, one of the earliest hominins famous for this hairy lady, already had the bigger brains than their fellow mammals with a size of about 430 cubic centimeters. And even though we shrinked a little after Neanderthals, we Homo sapiens still have the biggest brains ever along with the highest evolved intelligence. You know what they say. Hi, it's Jungna. I'm a musician and former journalist from Seoul, South Korea. We all live through and inside the special organ called the human brain, which makes up our human reality, personally and socially. And we all experience its presence all the time through memories. Physically, memory roughly has three stages of encoding, working, and consolidation. Neuroscientist Endo Tulving thought that encoding is about remembering an event in the past rather than defining it as knowledge. So that memory is episodic, not semantic, and working memory is in the middle of that kind of short-term memory and firmly stored data traveling back and forth between the medial temporal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. If the first is like Wikipedia, the storage of facts, the second is basically Snapchat. It has delay period activity so that you can take time to decide whether or not to save that unsolicited dick pic from a stranger. <laughs> and finally, in the process of consolidation, those registered memories become permanent like the ancient one in Kathmandu through two phases of long-term potentiation, or LTP, based on the galaxy-like networks of synapses and then systems consolidation to make the data more trans-temporally engraved in our whole ego over years and even decades. Through these mechanisms, we can not only maintain our consistent self-awareness from childhood to however old we are right now, but also learn more complex structures like language and expand our intellectuality deeper and wider. Each one of us is a web and Donald Trump is the Green Goblin. It's always been neuroscience's goal to clarify the center of that last system's consolidation that transfers the synaptic memory to the long-term storage. The classic answer is the hippocampus, which originally means this guy in Greek. If you've seen Inside Out, a fantastic film, this house where these slimes have an orgy every night is called the limbic system, which controls basically everything about our mind including emotion, motivation, attention, all the shuns. And the hippocampus is that old pipe in the middle in which the girl's memories flow, except that we actually have two hippocampi like any other mammal. That bitch has sadness though. The earliest evidence that showed the importance of that region was an American epilepsy patient called Henry Mollison who had a lobotomy to bilaterally remove his hippocampi in 1953 when he was 27 and became a sensational case for not being able to add a record to his brain since the surgery, which is called anterograde amnesia. So, so the so-called standard model of consolidation describes the hippocampus as the Fox River State Penitentiary. Memory is meant to escape the prison and move to the neocortex to become long-term. Then there's multiple trace theory or MTT, which is basically orange in the new black. Episodic memories stay in the hippocampus enjoying each other's milkshake or cream juice, whatever. And semantic memories also still partially rely on mama's house because they require certain traces to be recalled in detail. You know, like the freshman Andy who just couldn't get over them fucking toys or us who just get all these references because we just couldn't get over Pixar however the fuck all we got. So the theories of consolidation have focused mostly on how memories move from one place to another until April this year when an MIT research team led by Nobel Prize winner Susumu Tonegawa published an innovative study via science in which the interdisciplinary authors explain that we actually get memories through both the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex from the beginning. Meaning short-term and long-term memory are born at the same time. Kind of like Snapchat memories. 
I mean, idiots will still capture the photos even though there's a fucking save button right there. In this recent study, there's poor mice who got tortured by being put in a chamber and given an electric shock. So they freeze and get a fear memory about that particular place. The researchers didn't hypnotize anyone like those horrible motherfuckers. But they have secret devices called engram cells. Engrams, which 19th century German zoologist Richard Sam Sam Salmon, sorry, Salmon first found out, act as electrical signals in revealing where a certain memory responds to a certain given situation. The result, both the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex in the mice's brains have fear-related engram cells a day after the electric shock which is now shocking to us, not because now you'll have to suffer twice when you have a bad three-way like this, but because the brain works as a whole through a rapid circuit when an event occurs. Maybe this could explain how this kind of speed readers recall everything after quickly scanning the pages, or so they claim. Better yet, it can make clear that some people really have their heads up their asses. According to Tim Tonegawa, the engrams in the prefrontal cortex stay silent for two weeks and then gradually mature or become active, while those in the hippocampus fade because the brain then have the long-term memory to respond with appropriate behavior. So are the hippocampus traces gone for good? Takashi Kitamura, one of the authors, is not sure yet. Although the researchers were given with only a limited amount of time for the experiment, he says, this silent engram may reactivate even at very remote time points in order to help us recall the memory better or relive, if you will. Like, like many young adult boys around my age still get arousal and have their own time or turn into a silent state. Recalling the 10, 15 year old contact experiences over and over again. Not me because I'm a decent person. I pay each time. Anyway, if such a thing is possible, no matter how much time passes, could we really say at the end of the day we can clearly distinguish short-term and long-term memory when we can always retrieve that live feeling? Furthermore, does time still precede memory? You see a lot of people who even argue that time as a whole is an illusion. So how long is long-term memory? And how the hell short is Bill O'Reilly? I have no fucking idea. Thank you for watching. See you next week too. I'm your